when I look outside and see how beautiful where our, we are blessed to live, and I see this extraordinary uh, way we've been graced, it makes me ex really want to do everything I can to preserve, protect, and make sure it's here for hundreds of years, not just for my children, but for my grandchildren, great grandchildren. So with that in mind, what we're going to talk about today is the Safe Energy Project of the World Business Academy. I founded the World Business Academy in 1986, it was incorporated in 1987, for 501c3, I've written numerous books. My first book, I knew about energy, was in 1997, it was a college textbook published by Simon and Schuster. Uh, my most recent book on nuclear energy was about seven and a half years ago. Uh, so it's an area I've had a lot of community in. Now my day job is I'm a merchant banker. So you, you hear about all this stuff. This is what a business person does if they're trying to solve a really large problem. If you, dig, if you dig into it, boy, you wouldn't lose any other business problem. So we formed a thing called the Safe Energy Project. It came out of a task force that started about 14 years ago called the Energy Task Force. Uh, we actually had a giant meeting right here at the Best Parker about nine years ago. The result of that was we published a book and we started digging more into some of these energy questions and the Safe Energy Project was born last October. Did this seem a little dramatic to you, this line, no one has to die? I did that on purpose because this is a very serious subject. It turns out people are dying and we didn't even know. So the goal of the Safe Energy Project Permanently shut down San Jose nuclear power plant. That was our objective since last October. That wasn't achieved. As you know, about 10 days ago, San Jose was closed permanently. Number two, prevent overcharging and obtain a rebate for costs to Southern California Edison customers, potentially returning hundreds of millions of dollars for, because of this Edison mismanagement. As I was leaving the door this morning, I finished the last uh, couple of paragraphs on a petition to return over $500 million to the ratepayers in the state of California. And that petition is now being heard by the California Public Petition Group. It'll be filed by 5 o'clock today. So hopefully, up to $500 million or more from that one abuse of, of, of power. We want to also provide clean, safe, renewable energy solutions to replace the power in California. Um, it's pretty comfortable in this room right today, isn't it? You feel comfortable? I feel it's comfortable. Air conditioning is working. Has anybody experienced a brownout today? Anybody experienced a loss of electricity? Well, that's interesting because yesterday the Outlet Canyon was shut down. Santa Rosa has been shut down since January of 2012. And the, the chairman of the California Energy Commission went on the news this morning to say, don't worry, we have plenty of excess power in California. The, the margin is way above what we are concerned about. And even though it's probably the hottest day of the year, we're still fine. So relax, California, we have about interested in why we have these news that we're paying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars every year for. Actually, the question we're laundering is what we're paying for. We want to close the Apple Canyon nuclear power plant. Um, I'm going to explain why in a moment, but it affects everyone in this world, which we'll see. And last but not least, we've been asked to assist by providing a statewide voter education campaign there will be a, the state Supreme Court has just approved, uh, our client following Ben, our associate Ben Davis, has had his referendum approved, which will not only close the outlaw, and I think we should try to get closed before then, but will make it illegal to ever open a nuclear power plant again in the state of California. That referendum requires a tremendous amount of educational activity, so people will know why nuclear is not only dangerous, it's the most extraordinarily expensive form of power the world has ever known. So there's San Onofre, and as you said, that plant, plant is now permanently closed as of January, June 7. How much um, has this mismanagement cost? As of today, it's actually a little higher. It was 1.2 billion is what we have paid for power they didn't deliver since January of 2012, and that bill goes up every single day, and we think that's outrageous. If anybody in this room, in their business, refused to deliver their product or services to a customer, what would you be allowed to build them for, and how would you collect? Think about it. So we're at 1.2 billion for zero power, and it's one another every day. The Safe Energy Project is fighting for hundreds of millions of dollars, what we call clawbacks. We want that money back. It shouldn't have been taken in the first place. An order was issued, by the way, in November of 2012. The order went to Southern California is from the California Public Utilities Commission. The order said, "You have not shown us why we're paying you all this money." And we're going to put you on notice that you have a burden of proof now. You must demonstrate why are you charging all 
this money. And what you've spent so far, my term would be gobbledygook. And as I stand here today, on June 28th, they have still failed to meet the burden of that proof. In other words, they've still never been able to show us how they come up with these numbers or why. And in fact, in a hearing that ended two weeks ago, their principal economic witnesses said, we don't even know if we're capable of doing that. To which we said, that's OK, we'll, we'll figure it out for you. It was a shot. So <clears throat> we see, in addition to those clawbacks, we see a huge bill they're taking a filing against us to close this plant, which has been closed in January 2012 anyway. And by the way, for which they've already put over a billion dollars in trust fund. So why are they going to bill us another $3 billion? Last but not least, we believe they're going to overcharge us for the, the spent fuel rods, which they want to store. And what's fascinating, when they announced that they're going to charge us for that, they haven't put a number to it yet, they failed to announce that they've already been receiving checks from the federal government for precisely the same thing. So that's, that's what Southern California Edison has been up to, our electricity company. So there's a reason we no longer test nuclear weapons above ground. Remember that? We used to test nuclear weapons. Why did we stop doing that? Here's the reason why. This guy, JFK. In July 26th of 1963, Kennedy made the statement, the loss of even one human life, or the malformation of even one baby who may be born long after we are gone, should be a concern to all of us. Our children and grandchildren are not merely statistics toward which we can be indifferent. As soon as he issued that statement, Kennedy unilaterally suspended all above ground nuclear testing, sent the data he relied upon, called the Tooth Fairy Project data, to the other heads of governments that had nuclear weapons, including France, Russia, China, and said, we're, we're, we're radiating our own people. We're going to stop unilaterally. You folks ought to also. And in the last significant act of his life, and of his presidency, on October 23rd, less than a month before he was shot, he signed the above ground nuclear test ban. Why did he do that? Because he has children. He had two children, Carol and John. He also had a, a wife who was a And what he discovered in the baby teeth study that was conducted for him found out that <clears throat> we had this buildup going on in our atmosphere of a thing called strontium 90. Can I have a show of hands? How many people know what strontium 90 is? Anybody here? Okay, a few of you do. Good. Okay, so the short version is it's one of the most highly toxic radioactive isotopes known to, him, to man. Okay, it's, it's highly, highly toxic. No carcinogen. Nobody disputes that. And there are only two sources of strontium 90 on the planet Earth. And only come about one of two ways. One, above ground nuclear testing. The only other way you can get strontium 90 is the normal operation of every single nuclear power plant in America. The normal operation. See, strontium 90 is created every day as a known byproduct of nuclear fission. So this is what happened. After the test ban effect went into effect, we saw this dramatic decrease of ambient levels of strontium 90. And it looked like things were heading in the right direction, except something happened. Nuclear power began expanding dramatically right about here in the early 70s. This is what happened to Stormy 90. You'll notice it is now above the levels that it was at when Kennedy acted to ban above ground nuclear testing. That's right. And by the way, Strontium 90 has a 29 year half life, which means that the Strontium 90 I admit today will be here for a minimum of 29 years at full strength, and then it decays after that. So every day we continue to put this stuff in the air, that line has got to go higher and higher and higher. And it now is above where Kennedy unilaterally acted. We have literally now eliminated 100% of the benefit of stopping nuclear testing below the ground. Isn't that insane? So we've reversed this. And we now have to say to ourselves, what are we going to do about it? So strontium-90, just to let you know, is a silent killer. Okay, unlike cigarettes, where you don't have to smoke if you don't want to, and you don't have to stay in a room with secondhand smoke anymore. So you can avoid it, but you can't avoid inhaling strontium 90. And you can't avoid it bonding to your calcium, but that's what it does. So it takes collective action to prevent the deadly consequences of nuclear pollution. It's not something I can do for myself. It's not something you can do for yourself. We have to do this together. And to do it, we've got to be willing to get educated. So do we know closing nuclear power plants 
will actually save the lives of women, men, and children. The number one victims of strontium-90 pollution are children. And the reason is because the faster your calcium is forming, which means the bones in your body, so when you're growing as a child, the more strontium-90 you get bonded to your calcium and the more you have. So when Kennedy was given his data, the way they obtained the data, the Tooth Fairy Project was when they went around and they took the teeth of children that they then matched to where the child was, where the child existed in utero with the mother, where the child grew up, and where the child lived until the tooth fell out. When the tooth fell out, the federal government did this program had tens of thousands of teeth mailed in. They pulverized the teeth, and they were able then to determine with great specificity where, in fact, the strontium-90 levels were the highest. And what they found was they were the highest exactly where you'd expect strontium-90 to fall out of the above ground nuclear test. That test, with that, that same exact test was replicated 12 years ago, and it was called the, the Tooth Fairy Project. And the data showed exactly the same results with exactly the same predictability on strontium-90. And the chart you saw a while ago of strontium-90 going back up is based on the same data by the same people who took it. And the physicist who actually designed that test for Kennedy is actually still alive to this day. It's now in his late 80s. You know, so do we know if you close a nuclear power plant, you can save lives? By the way, this past, the second biggest category for children are women, particularly if they're lactating women. So this is, a, this is a, a, a toxin that attacks our women and children. And it also creates tremendous numbers of prostate cancers. Okay, so do we know if you close plants, you can save them? Yes, we do. We closed Rancho Seco in 1989 by a local initiative. This man, Ben Davis, who did it, very interesting character. He's like your every man. He's a, he's a blue collar guy who just got excited about this topic. And he's the person we've been helping with the referendum that's now going to be on the ballot in 2014. <clears throat> so we closed Rancho Seco. After the shutdown, childhood cancer rates in the surrounding area dropped dramatically. That's what happened. Went from there to there. Now we'll get this line in the middle. You say to yourself, how come it dropped below that line? And the reason is Rancho Seco was in a rural area. You would not expect levels of childhood cancers to be as high in a rural area as an urban area because there are fewer toxins, fewer environmental toxins. So what actually happened is the people living in Rancho Seco had their cancer rates fall to where they should have been in the first place because they're in a rural area. Now we also know, in addition to childhood leukemias and cancers, after the shutdown, thyroid cancers dropped dramatically. There's where they started, there's where they ended the last time they were measured. Okay. Same thing would happen if you measured prostate, but we couldn't get the data as clear on prostate and what would be factors. So <coughs> the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, or SMUG, is a perfect example of what happens when you transition a nuclear power plant to clean and green energy. And by the way, the man running it at the time they closed that plant, David Freeman, has become now the biggest advocate of eliminating nuclear power. He was completely converted and became the advocate of doing this everything. So as a nuclear utility, SMUD lost $575 million in 1989. Without nuclear, they made $46 million in 1992. That's how bad nuclear is financially. So apart from the silent killer, which is strong in 90, and apart from the fact that nuclear power is insanely expensive, and apart from the fact that there is no long-term storage solution for radioactive isotopes that will remain deadly for 10,000 years. These spent nuclear fuel rods don't just decay overnight, as you know, and there is no place to store them. So they're kept largely in above ground or slightly below ground cooling ponds, which are extraordinarily easy to access for terrorists. The 9-11 the uh, terrorists, their backup target was a nuclear power plant in New York. And in fact, they did, uh, they, they did a dry run over it with, uh, with a, a private airplane before uh, Osama bin Laden constructed the, the uh, World Trade Center because they thought it was a bigger visual image. So this stuff is going to remain lethal for 10,000 years. We can't ignore, however, apart from all of that, that in addition, catastrophes do happen. We know about Three Mile Island, we know about Chernobyl, and now, of course, we know about Fukushima. <coughs> now, here's the fun thing to know about Fukushima. It happened three years ago. Did you all in this room, I'm gonna show you, how many of you knew that the nuclear reaction that began Fukushima 
is still going on today. How many of you do that? Okay. Most people thought it went away. It's continuing to put radioactive isotopes into the water and the ground because they can't stop the reaction. And the reason they can't stop the reaction is that they get to it to cool it. So this is not a minor problem. What about Diablo Canyon? Well, it's a major risk to the health of the Central Coast. Why? Every day it puts up Sparky 90. I'm going to show you where it falls in a second. Okay. Second of all, when they built this thing, they didn't know about any of these fault lines. They were told by the head examiner for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in 2011 in a written report that now that they know about those fault lines, it is unsafe to continue to operate the Apple Canyon for another single day. The report went to Washington. The head of the field supervisory team said, we don't agree with you. We're going to give you a chance to change your report because this could be very bad for your career. He gave a written statement to the local newspaper saying, what I said was true and I'm not changing it and I'll stand by it. By the way, no factual evidence has ever been deduced that he was wrong. In fact, all the evidence has come out is that he's right. To see what happens, and you can't quite see it in the slide, you see where this Fosbury Fault is? It actually crosses the San Andreas Fault, just above where the D and Diablo is. That's significant because when you have two fault lines and they connect, it dramatically increases the potential power of an earthquake from that fault line. So here you have San Onofre literally sitting in a triangle of several earthquake fault lines on all sides. And this is a plant that was built so badly they built it twice. Are you aware of that? Show of hands. Anybody know they built it twice? No? Okay. So you don't want to tell you why they built it twice. The first time they built it, they read the design upside down on the architectural drawing. So, uh, yes, they did. It's fact. You can't make this stuff up. It's too good to be made it up. So they ended up having to rebuild the whole plant. And they put it in a place that is probably one of the most seismically active places in California. By the way, in case you're wondering if they've ever had a tsunami there, that's the Fukushima issue, right? All of those four circles are places where tsunami damage has been detected in significant quantities, meaning we've had tsunamis hit all around that plant. By the way, and that comes from the U.S. government accountability project. It's not stuff that we just pull out of there. Now here's the plume, okay? That's the Apple Canyon. This shows the radiation plume of strontium-90, and that's where you're sitting. This is what's called the 100-mile circle. This is what's called the 50-mile circle. The plume is showing you on the 50-mile circle. What nuclear theory says is that if you're within the 50-mile circle, and remember when Fukushima was stopped, they made a 50-mile zone for no humans. Remember that? And they put a 50-mile zone around the plant because that's how you can't get closer than that and still be safe. But what happens with strontium-90, because it's lighter, it, it, it travels with the wind. That plume is showing you the flow of wind, which you're all familiar with, that comes down here. So it actually crosses out of the 50-mile zone to get to us. That's the end of the plume. However, if I were to show you that same plume extended to the 100-mile, it would be over here, the Ventura. The reason there's a 100-mile circle, because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says that if you're going to be involved in the sustained exposure, you shouldn't have exposure from the radioactivity that you can get from a defective plant if you're within 100 miles. So 50 is mandatory, 100 is suggested. We're sitting well within 100 if you take the plume into account. So even the recent chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission feels it is no longer safe. Listen to this. This is in 2013. All 104 nuclear power plants in operation have a safety problem in our face. This is the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission talking, Gregor Jasko. Now, that's an astounding statement, folks. Can you imagine? That's the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission telling you that. So if you don't sit up and take notice of that, what does it take for us to wake up? I love the quote, continuing to put band-aid on band-aid is not going to fix the problem. So here's what's interesting. What happened yesterday? They closed down Diablo. Why? Minor leak detected. Close it down to the power line. It's not a minor leak. Okay. In fact, in that particular incident, however, it's boric acid and it's probably easy to fix from a defective well. So here's a quick question. If you were to look at the safety records of every nuclear power plant in the United States of America, as determined by the employees work, working there, you would find that Diablo has over 110% more safety complaints by their own employees than the average nuclear reactor in America. It's twice as dangerous. And he's telling you all 104 were too dangerous to be in existence. That's what's just done blocking us. Now, 
California does not need nuclear power. This is one of the things that they always throw up. And by the way, notice how this line remains flat up to 2020. And the reason is it turns out that that line is actually sloping down. We're using less power today than we did five years ago. Interesting. And we're learning to be more efficient. And this is all total power. So this morning, the chairman of the California Energy Commission literally said it's going to be the hottest day of the year. We don't have Diablo, we don't have San Onofre, and we've got tons of excess power. And that's what he's referring to. All of that exists above peak summer energy demand. Now, we'll go above peak demand today, most <laughs> like a little bit above it, because this is beyond normal. But you're still way, as he was saying, way into the excess power range. So if we don't need it, if it's too expensive, it's deadly, and it's crazy, why do we have it? You know, the good news is, if we thought we needed more energy, and there is a, a docket we're going to participate in. We're going to represent the people of the state of California starting in late July in a docket before the Public Utilities Commission, basically helping design a strategy to convert the entire state over to hydrogen. Uh, the nation of Iceland has already accomplished this feat. Uh, Germany is well on its way to accomplishing this feat. And all the hydrogen we're going to implement here in California, we're recommending, can be done for less than we're currently paying for energy system with greater safety, and 100% of the hydrogen is going to come from renewable sources. If you want to know more about that, please let us know. We'd love to tell you why. So we've got all of these huge, huge natural resources in California, but we're not using them. Why does this happen? I want to just remind you, there are some examples of industries that, for their own economic reasons, have chosen to lie to the public, pay the PR firms, store the facts, and do it in a way that causes us to have to pay the price to the public. Who are those industries? Well, there's the most famous one, of course. We now know that the tobacco industry had a memo in its files going back to 1963, acknowledging that tobacco killed people and that that's what they were doing, but that they didn't want to look the word out. You all remember how long it took to get the tobacco companies to tell the truth. It didn't happen easily. And who controlled the conversation for those decades? The tobacco industry, because they had the most at stake. Okay, so we know there's an industry that lied to us, and it lied to us when it knew it was killing us and it was taking a lot of money out of our pockets. Here's another one. This word, these words, clean coal, are the biggest oxymoron. That's like jumbo shrimp, clean coal, it's like possible. The fossil fuel industry is dominating the entire conversation on energy sources. It's flooding you with absolute lies on, on television, radio, it's concocting all kinds of incredibly crazy scenarios. And if anybody doesn't believe in climate change and that it's here, I urge you to look up the work of Richard Mueller. Richard Mueller was the last scientist of any credibility at UC Berkeley. He was funded in a private study for two years by the Koch brothers, who are noted for their climate denial because they're fake fossil fuel people. And at the end of the two years, Richard Mueller, this guy was a MacArthur Fellow as a kid, he's a very bright guy. He said, not only have I concluded that climate change is real and that it's much worse than we had thought, I also am concluding that it's caused by humans. That was a, he wrote that as an opinion op-ed in the New York Times. So this is another industry, though, that lies to kill, the nuclear industry. Who are the people that have something at stake and why? This is who they are. And unfortunately, in this case, you not only have the industry, nuclear suppliers, but you have public utilities involved as well. Public utilities have one advantage that every other industry doesn't have. They control your state capitals. You try to have a thoughtful conversation in Sacramento about nuclear industry, and you're going to have a hard time. So in addition to Mitsubishi and Westinghouse, by the way, Westinghouse is no longer owned by Americans. In fact, the only companies up here that are owned by Americans are Duke, Edison, and Pacific Gas and Electric. Every single nuclear power company in America has gone out of business or sold their interests. By the way, one of the largest technical companies in the world, Siemens, did the same thing. The handwriting's on the wall. You're going to read about nuclear in 10 years the way you now read about asbestos, and you're going to wonder how they got away from it and so on. So that's basically it. Who is the World Business Academy? We're the a business group. So we, we think we're, we're watchdogs. Try to watch what business people would watch. We try to do it in your interest. I'd love it if you would leave your names or email addresses at the door. We'd love to keep you in touch with what we're going to be doing going forward. I'm very hopeful and optimistic we're going to return hundreds of millions of dollars to everybody in this room and our associates across the Southern California Edison District. Uh, we'll probably file a collateral action against San Diego, by the way, and eventually get the Pacific.
get gas and electric. But there's a lot of money at stake. More importantly, there's a lot of lives at stake. So that's why we call this presentation the Safe Energy Project. And our goal, as you can see, no one has to die. Because the truth is no one has to. And in fact, it's all a lot less expensive if we do this right. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate that was a lot. <laughs>